Hi, I'm Deanna Springer. On behalf of Nancy Zeman Productions and PBS Wisconsin, welcome to the virtual Great Wisconsin Quilt Show. Enjoy this educational presentation. And afterward, be sure to explore all the virtual event has to offer, including beautiful virtual quilt exhibits, an interactive vendor mall, and more. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the show. Welcome. I'm Bill Kerr from Modern Quilt Studio. My wife, Weeks Ringle, and I have been making quilts together for 20, actually over 20 years now. And we also do YouTube videos, publish Modern Quilts Illustrated, design fabric, and get to teach people like you, which is such a pleasure. Today, what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about finishing touches. And by this, I mean little details like quilting, how you do it, the color you do it with, the pattern you use, and also binding. Because usually when you start a quilt, you usually begin with a big idea. You, you have a reason you're making this quilt. Maybe it's your best friend's birthday coming up or your nephew is going off to college and you want to make a quilt in special colors, with a pattern you love, and you think about those big, big decisions right away. But a lot of times, people don't think all the way through things like how they're going to quilt it, how they're going to bind it, until the very end. So I kind of look at quilting as almost like a movie director. You've got a movie you want to make, and you want every bit of it to you know, work together to make a great film. So you're the director and you want even the supporting roles to win Oscars. So you want your quilting to be you know, the best supporting um, actor, you want the binding to be the best supporting actor. And so by thinking about those details in advance or sometimes just at the end, you know, that's okay too, you can create a quilt that is just as fun to make as it is to look at when you're done. So what I'd like to do is walk you through a series of quilts where I'll talk about the design approach that we had in making these decisions. And I'm going to start with the Three Cheers quilt from our Rediscovering Your Stash publication. When you look at this, you can't even see the quilting, can you? The fabrics are so many different colors. There's a lot of movement, there's a lot of shape, and the quilting is important in every quilt, but the actual design of the quilting, the pattern, is not as important in this quilt because you just can't see it, it's really busy. And we have kind of a, an approach to choosing quilting patterns. If your design, if your fabrics are calm, simple, there's an opportunity to see the quilting. So if you want, you can go all out with your quilting. If the fabrics or the piecing are really complex, it might be a lot harder to see. So you have to ask yourself, you know, do I want to put my time into elaborate quilting there? And also, like, this is supposed to be fun. And sometimes quilting, elaborate quilting patterns on busy fabrics is just hard. You can't see what you're doing. Our Spellbound quilt, which is a giant kaleidoscope that is set in this deep, dark, teal solid, is really different. Because in the elaborate pieced kaleidoscope, we chose to simply stipple the quilt. You can't really see it. The beauty of this quilt is in the craftsmanship, in matching the wedges that create the butterfly effect of this star. But the background is a beautiful solid, and this solid shows off quilting 
with the shadow that's created. So if you look here in this photo, from a distance you can see that you get the striking star, the striking shape of the piecing. But when you get up close, you can see the beautiful doodle quilting that Weeks did actually on this. She has just a, a wonderful, loose way of putting on good music and drawing lovely, lovely details with her quilting. And that looks great on the solid. But there would be no reason to do that in the pieced kaleidoscope. You just wouldn't see it. This is our rank and file quilt. And when you look at this overall photo of it, you can see from a distance, you have this great ombre from light to dark. And as you go down the quilt, you have over a hundred fabrics that create this gradient, but they're all solids, which really give you the opportunity to show off quilting. And with this quilting, there's a step from the top bands are done in a light gray, and then it goes to a medium light, then a medium, then a medium dark, working its way down. As you can see in this detail, the threads really respond to the color of the quilting there. Another quilt that is very different in terms of the quilting would be our accordion quilt. This is a quilt that I, I always refer to as library colors. You feel like you're in a wood paneled room with leather spine books and everything is calm and quiet. And as the kind of movie director here, this whole idea of handsome, quiet was the feel that we wanted for the whole quilt. So even though these are solid fabrics that could show off quilting, showing off doesn't mean it has to be elaborate. What we did here was use extremely simple straight line quilting in kind of a camel colored thread. There are so many different colors in this quilt. And rather than change thread colors, which could be busy, we just picked a very medium value camel colored thread that kind of disappeared and kept everything nice and calm. When we talk about quilting, it's not just about the quilt pattern. There's always that issue of what thread color do you use? And I'm sure most of you have been taught the very useful trick of not looking at the thread color on the spool or the cone, but to take a single strand and lay that on top of the quilt. Well, we go one step further. You know, putting the strand of thread on top of the quilt is smart because that's closer to how you'll see it. But the reality is your thread never lies directly on top of the quilt. It gets stitched into it. And depending on the kind of batting you use and whether or not you wash your quilts, we always wash our quilts and we almost always use uh, cotton batting which gives a really nice wrinkly texture, that means that not only is your thread a single strand, but it is in a valley. So it's not on top where the light hits it. It's deep in a furrow where there's going to be a bit of a shadow. And that means it's always a little darker than you might expect. So we tend to err on the side of choosing a slightly lighter thread, just in general. But we always have to think about each individual quilt. So here's an example, super colorful. This is our Go Big quilt that uses a multitude of multicolored, bright, bright fabrics that are offset with this nice half inch strip of white on the diagonal. So when you quilt this, there are lots of questions to ask yourself. You could pick, um, a lot of people might say, oh, it's so colorful. I want to pick another bright color. Now, if I did this and did an all over pattern, that kind of dark red orange would kill the kind of purity of the white. So I could choose to leave the white unquilted or what we did was chose white. 
and we quilt it all over. And a lot of people would look at this and say like, oh, I don't, I don't want the white to show everywhere. You know, the reality is a little different. When you look at this, you barely see the quilting thread. It gets in the, that little furrow and you see the texture of the wavy lines that we've quilted, but the white disappears on the white and it also amazingly disappears on the multicolors. We have a quilt called Give Me Liberty. And I'll admit, I'm a sucker for Liberty of London fabrics. They're delicate, they're beautifully printed, they're crazy expensive, but if you're gonna use them, you've gotta show them off. And this pattern, as you can see in this overall shot, creates another nice general fade from the top where they're slightly lighter to the bottom where they're slightly darker. And we made them very visible by offsetting them with this kind of olive drab solid that prevents you from having all the Liberty of London's kind of overwhelm the quilt. And it gives each of them a nice crisp edge. So the question with this is, how do you choose to quilt it? The Liberty of London fabrics are busy. They're very detailed little prints. The solid is plain. What we chose here was to pick a thread color that was lighter than the olive and do little kind of peacock-like feathers all over. And what this does is on the busy Liberty of London prints, you don't see the quilting at all because the fabrics are, are so intricate. However, on the solids, you get the peacock feather shapes over and over, which kind of turn the solids into almost like a print that behaves so well and goes really, really well with the prints. <clears throat> One more. So here we have our glyphs quilt. And this is a quilt that uses an improvisational technique with dozens of blocks, each of which is cut and spliced and sewn differently. And the idea behind this quilt is while each block is a little gem, when you look at them all together from a distance, like you do in this photo here, your eye goes around the quilt and it looks at one block, then another, then another. It doesn't get stuck in one place. And so we wanted to make sure that the quilting in this case unified the entire quilt. And once again, we often talk about texture in our quilting. We wanted to use a quilting pattern. And in this case, we call it the labyrinth pattern which is a series of kind of freehand um, square and rectangular free form sp square spirals. And what it does is create a wonderful texture across the whole quilt without emphasizing any one particular block, without echoing any of the shapes. It just gives a very nice overall feel. So once again, this is where we use a quilt thread that kind of disappeared in this mushroom background color. And because we knew there would be a lot of texture, we picked you know, a really neutral medium that wouldn't, wouldn't steal the show. Once again, you want it to be a supporting actor. You don't want it to steal the thunder. Our best of both worlds quilt, which uses a blend of modern and Civil War reproduction fabrics, was a quilt that we knew could get a lot of use as a throw on a sofa. And when you know it's going to get a lot of use, you can think of it as a utilitarian quilt that we wanted to make sure the density of the quilting was really good so the quilt would hold up with lots of washings because we never hesitate to wash our quilts. You know, we're, we're the kinds of people that are happy to have uh, our dog hop up on the quilt or who knows, you're having a snack and you spill something on it. I just like to be able to use quilts. So in the case of a quilt that's going to be a throw, it's nice to know that it will hold up with lots of washings. And in this case, it's stippled. 
some people, like, I, I teach workshops and sometimes people badmouth stippling, like, oh, it's a cop-out. No, it's not. If it works for you, great. It can be very practical. If you're good at it and you don't have a lot of time and you enjoy it, absolutely keep it in the mix. Um, don't let uh, other people's judgment of your quilting decisions get in your way. Another example of decisions you make with these finishing touches that really impact the quilt in a big way would be with our small change quilt. This is hand quilted. If you're going to spend hours hand quilting, you want to see it, right? Um, so in this case, we have simple square forms with little donut shapes hand quilted. I don't want to spend hours, and actually I laugh because Weeks did this, <laughs> um, but I guarantee you she didn't want to spend hours and not be able to see it. So she made a couple really smart decisions here. She chose um, Quilter's Dream Dream Wool Batting. It's kind of a low to medium loft, and it gives you just enough poof to accentuate the quilting. If you quilted really close together, it probably wouldn't have the same effect, but these, these circles have quilting that's about between half an inch and three quarters of an inch apart, and it gives you a really nice kind of bump that catches the light beautifully. And she also made a, a smart decision to use a beige, kind of beigey taupe quilting thread that was not a color found in any of the fabrics in the quilt, which meant that you could see it in one way or another on every single square. We're always taking turns with these projects. I've quilted about half the quilts you've seen. Weeks has quilted about half. This is one that I just, I was dying to do. And the finishing touch is actually the entire concept here. This quilt is a quilted pillow called Fringe Benefits. And we had just designed Warp and Weft premium yarn dye lines for Benertex, and I loved the feel of them. And we decided to do a really interesting experiment. We pinned down squares of all the different fabrics on white. And I sewed them on with kind of a box and an X, staying about an eighth to a quarter of an inch away from all of the edges. So the edges were raw. And then I quilted the white in simple straight lines, made the pillow top, and tossed it in the machine letting all of the edges fray. And it took maybe five or 10 minutes to pull out the frayed bits, but it gave this amazing, oh, and look, see, you still occasionally get a little one that you can pull out, but it left this great texture, very chenille-like, and the quilting actually transformed the entire piece. The quilting on the white was in concentric squares that stayed parallel to the edges. And what that does is it kind of visually contains the center and it provides a crisp, um, a crispness that contrasts nicely with the looseness and the softness of the fraying. So we've talked a lot about the quilting, how the batting affects the way you see it, how the thread color affects it. But now let's move to the real finishing touch, which is binding. And first I want to talk about three general methods. Many of the quilts we make, actually I'd say most of the quilts we make, like this tube socks quilt that I pieced and quilted, we finish with a all-in-one, kind of one-step binding. This is done with the, using the clover binding tool to make a simple binding that we put on the quilt and top stitch. I'm an unapologetic machine user. So I like this method, which we explain. We have um, YouTube videos if you want to check it out. If you've never done it, don't be afraid. It's, it's really, it's fun. It's not hard. And we've done two really exhaustive YouTube videos that explain the whole process. 
And so in this, what you get is a top stitched binding. And that binding is really durable. And not only that, I can bind a queen size quilt in about 45 minutes. Well, we do machine bind with a top stitch method, the majority of our quilts, there is a time and a place for hand, hand finished, hand sewn bindings. Some people simply love the relaxation of that handwork, but we sometimes choose it for design reasons. This is our United States of Green quilt. And this quilt, if you look at it, is made up of hundreds and hundreds of thin strips of different greens. Some of them are as thin as a quarter of an inch. And we chose to do the hand finished binding on this because it's a little flatter than the machine binding. When you top stitch the binding, it tends to wrinkle more and the texture of that binding looks more like the texture of the quilt. If you hand finish it, it's kind of taut. It fills up the binding more and it's a smoother look. So that's another reason to do it. One other difference with the hand finished binding and the machine top stitch binding would have to do with shows and competitions. If you're the competitive type, quilt judges still like to see a hand finished binding. Personally, I love them both, but that, that is a difference to keep in mind. And then there's one other option. Actually, there are several, but the one other option that we use with some frequency is the French pillowcase method. This is our billiards quilt, and you'll see there's no binding on it at all. And the reason, again, is a design decision. This binding choice is, again, trying to be the best supporting actor. You know, you don't want a binding that, that gets in the way of the whole feel. Take a look at this quilt from a distance, and you can see how on the edges, those giant triangles come to precise points and touch the edge perfectly. If you had a binding on it, it would truncate those triangles and kind of interrupt the big gesture of the geometry. One of the reasons we like the pillowcase binding rather than a facing binding is we tend to use all of our quilts and with the pillowcase binding, the back will look just as crisp as the front. Whereas if you do a facing binding, you get kind of the wide flange all the way around that I think can be a little distracting. But again, it's your choice, whatever works best for you. The last thing I'd like to talk about with bindings, now that we've talked about technique, you know, hand, machine, pillowcase, is if you're doing a standard binding, whether it's by machine or by hand, how do you choose the fabric for it? And there are some times, like with our Acadia quilt, where it's this handsome blue-black that looks black on screen. This probably looks totally black, but in person, in the right light, you see that it's a dark, dark blue. If you put almost any other fabric there, it would pop. We wanted the binding to totally disappear here, so we bound it in the exact same fabric. There are other times, like in our Argyle quilt, which here, when you see it up on the wall, you can see that there are many different subtle shades of blues and greens. We didn't want the binding to kind of take sides here. We didn't want it to go towards the greens or the blues. So we kept it a very neutral, nice gray that played well with all of the fabrics in the quilt. Another approach is to have a contrasting binding. And we use this approach in our off the grid quilt, which is a series of colorful square and square blocks set on point on a stark white field. And we wanted a contrasting binding for two reasons here. One, a white binding just isn't practical. If you've ever tried it, you know how quickly it will get dirty and that won't make the quilt look good. And the second reason was we actually love the crisp frame that you get here. And if you're ever in an art museum, 
usually think that you go to look at the art. One of the things I love to do is to look at the frames because framing art has changed over the years. There have been periods where it's been trendy to have no frame. There have been periods where there are you know, carved, rococo, gilded frames. There are periods where there are modern, crisp, black frames. So it's the same with quilting. We kind of go through periods where we like the, the frame, the binding to disappear or to be very visible. So if you're, you know, either looking at paintings online or you get out to a, a museum sometime, take a look at that. It's kind of a fun way to kind of cross train for your quilting. And here's one more example of a very visible binding. This is our dress up quilt. And this takes that beautiful brick red that's in the quilt and it pops it all the way around and kind of sets off this nice light khaki color, kind of happy way and keeps the same spirit of the quilt. So the last two quilts I have to show you with the binding have to do with going all out. And when we made our on the dot quilt, this was made with our dot crazy fabrics for Benertex that were a whole series of color on color, small polka dots, large polka dots. And we wanted them to be a riot of happy color. So we thought, let's carry that spirit all the way out to the finishing touch of the binding. So we took all the leftover scraps, made a pieced binding, and really used that to set off the quilt. And when you look at this quilt in the overall photo, you can see that you not only have all the polka dots and the strong diagonals, but your eye goes all the way around the quilt, really enjoying that detail there as well. This is our Bright Eyes Baby Quilt. And research has shown that strong contrast really stimulates brain growth in babies. So we took full advantage of that with the black and white stripe and used that for a chunky, bold binding. I mean, come on, you can't help but smile when you look at this. And we even used a black and white print on the back. So with the binding, it's not only how does it look with the front, but how does it look on the back? All these decisions are ones that you make. You are the director of this quilt. You have the freedom to choose the techniques, the colors, the thread, the, the batting, and put it all together to make a beautiful quilt. And as I said earlier, sometimes you just have a quick weekend to put something together for a baby shower. Other times you spend months on the details. But no matter what level of time and detail you're putting into this, you can take a moment to make these choices that really make the finishing touches a wonderful part of your completed quilt. So it's been a pleasure talking to you. I hope you're doing well and that you have fun finishing up those quilts that are coming up next in your future. Thank you for joining us for Finishing Touches, Finishing Touches rather, with Bill Kerr. And we're glad to be welcoming Bill Kerr from his home studio in the Chicago area. Welcome, Bill. Thanks so much, Deanna. It's such a pleasure to be here. As much as I love Madison and I love Madison, it's great to be able to reach such a wide audience all over the country today. We're so excited to be gathering today for the Great Wisconsin Quilt Show. And I have to mention, I like seeing our doing, dueling uh, modern quilts behind us there. That's a really fun <laughs> look. Yeah. Go <Good> color. <laughs> well, we do have questions coming in uh, oh, from your lecture. It was so interesting, and I learned some things too. So great job, Bill. And we'll start okay. with a question from DeKalb, Illinois. On the kaleidoscope quilt, you showed beautiful stippling. Would you then leave the rest plain or stitch in the ditch? So with quilting, we always think of the quilting as a layer of design. 
And we think about how does it work with the piecing? So in the case of, I actually have it right here, the kaleidoscope quilt, I'll hold up a detail. In the solid areas, we did really elaborate quilting. And then in the piece, the areas with complex prints, we just did ordinary stippling because you can't really see it. We intentionally did not stitch in the ditch. If you like to, go ahead. But we look at the stitching as creating an additional layer and stitching in the ditch usually just reinforces what you ever what you already have. So I see it as a bit of a missed opportunity. Thank you, Bill. Our next question is from Jenny. She just finished her very first quilt top and wow. now she's hooked. She's hooked. Uh, her question is, is it okay to use a jelly roll strip uh, for binding? And is it a good practice to change colors of thread when you're machine quilting? Oh, wow. So there is so much to learn when you're new. The first thing is there aren't exact answers. A lot of it is experimentation and jelly rolls can make great bindings. One of the things that you'll find is it's not long enough usually to go all the way around the quilt. So you can piece a bunch of different fabrics together. There's nothing saying that the binding has to be the same all the way around. And in terms of um, switching color, you know, those are choices you get to make. And I'm going to encourage you, Jenny, to see what works for you. And your next quilt gives you another chance to try. There are no hard and fast rules. That's so true, Bill. Uh, question for you. I love the idea of using the cl clover uh, tool for the binding. Yeah. Uh, do you use a walking foot with a or a quarter inch foot when you're attaching the binding? And I think she's speaking of the um, clover bias tape maker you showed. Exactly. And that's a really helpful tool. I don't use a lot of tools, but that's one I love. And if someone wants to learn how to do that for the first time, they can certainly look. We have a YouTube tutorial about it. But when sewing that binding to the quilt, we use a walking foot because you've got a big sandwich. You basically have a binding and the quilt in it. And the walking foot helps it go all the way through. So that would be my choice. Very good. Uh, we have a popular question from three different viewers Whoa. Uh, asking, what is a pillowcase quilt and how do you do a pillowcase binding? So the pillowcase binding, actually, I think I've got this here. This, I'm gonna hold up a corner. This is our billiards quilt. And you'll notice there is no binding. The way it's done, you make the top and you sandwich the top, the batting and the backing, and you sew a quarter of an inch around on three sides and turn the whole thing inside out. So it's like a pillowcase. The seams are then on the inside. And the reason for that, it's, it's a lot more work. I'll tell you right now, but I'm gonna hold this up. What happens in this quilt, look at the edge. Do you see how that triangle comes exactly to the point of exactly to the edge? If there were a binding, it would overlap that point and cut it off, which is why we decided to do this technique. So in um, Modern Quilts Illustrated, our magazine, in issue 13, we have the pattern for this quilt and a sidebar that explains the pillowcase binding technique. Yeah, it's fun. Yes, and it, it gives a nice finished uh, look to the edge, which is a similar question coming from far west Texas mm -hmm. today. Have you ever faced a quilt? Would there be a cause where you might face a quilt? So facing is another technique where you don't have a visible binding, but you have basically a wide flange on the back. And if that technique works for you, you're welcome to do it. The reason we don't do it is we find that that flange wears a little unevenly over time. And I'm a big advocate of just using quilts. So if there's a technique that makes it a little less durable, 
I'll probably try something else. But if it's a technique that allows you to complete it, by all means, do it. Very good. A question from Linda. Does the raw edge quilting hold up to multiple washings? Do the squares continue to fray? So uh, Linda's asking about your pillow. Yeah. So, OK, I'm prepared. <laughs> I've got, this is the pillow that was in the video and called Fringe Benefits. And this started out with all the squares sewn right up touching each other and then stitched a little bit, about a quarter of an inch in all the way around. And with washing and drying, they fray. And the first time you pull it out, oh my gosh, you've got so much to pick. It's kind of, you know, just the good thing is you're watching a movie to pick the little frayed bits out. Each subsequent wash, it wears very well actually, but you have very few to pick out in the future. So you could totally do it as a baby quilt or a lap quilt. Again, experiment with the technique. I find that the fraying works best with yarn dyes and textiles like that that are woven rather than prints, which don't fray quite as uniformly. Great advice, Bill. And those woven fabrics, well, the, the frayed part, the fringe part will be the same color. It's, it's not uh, exactly. printed, it's, it's yarn dyed. So those- Yeah, exactly. So you don't get any undyed white bits. Mm -hmm. It's just really pure, rich color. Yeah, mm -hmm. good, good point. Mm -hmm. Great. Our next question is from Catherine. Bill, what do you think about using varied color threads? And perhaps Catherine's talking about variegated threads. So actually, let's talk about that in two different ways. There's the issue of varying threads, which is switching thread colors within a quilt top, which is a very common thing to do. And variegated threads, which you'll often see in a shop, you might see a spool that has thread that goes from green to purple to yellow. And I often see quilters purchase this thread when they think, oh, I've got a green, purple, and yellow quilt. This will match. Unfortunately, what usually happens is you have no control over what part of the thread ends up where on your quilt. And it can end up looking a little blotchy. You might get yellow on the purple or green on the purple. and it often doesn't look intentional. So I totally understand the marketing appeal of variegated threads. I, I shy away from them and prefer to just be decisive and use color that um, we choose. Yeah. Well, you're the movie director, Bill, so you're in control of the choices. And, and you, you, I'm sure you use varied threads too within uh, different quilts. We, we do, w without a doubt. There are times when you have a deep teal background and you want the quilting to disappear and you have a matching teal thread, but you have inset squares that are bright jewel tones. And there are times we change the thread within each block. But most of the time, honestly, I love all over quilting where there's just one thread that creates a texture and a uniformity. But again, it's, it's um, there are lots of choices. And it's one of the great things about being able to go through the quilt show virtually this year. I was really actually looking at a lot of people's thread choices because it's a great layer of design. The quilts are spectacular again this year, aren't they, Bill? Yeah. A question from Kathleen on Facebook. Is your quilting, if your quilting line is not continuous, do you need to tie off when you stop and start? So if you have, if you're quilting your quilt and you come to a stopping point, you have three choices. Cut the thread and do nothing. That will cause problems. Over time, it will pull out every washing, every use. I would not recommend that. Second choice is to cut the tails long, tie them into knots and bury the knot. That is time consuming, but there are people who do it. The third choice would be to back tack with small stitches, maybe seven small stitches and trim that. And that is usually really pretty secure. That's what we do most of the time. Great advice, Bill, thank you. 
Our next question is from Trish in Alabama. Oh, it's maybe a compliment. Uh, <laughs> Bill, you are the best, B-E-S-T in all caps. Oh, I, how sweet. <laughs> I love choosing uh, binding. Uh, I mean, I have missed it, but did you mention a scrappy binding? I recently cut strips from layer cake squares that were used uh, in the quilt, and she loves okay. it. Okay, I love doing that. And actually, I've got on my lap, I'm going to pull up, the on-the-dot quilt that we did with dozens of different polka dots, if you look at that binding, it's made entirely of the scraps from the top piecing. And I think the shortest part is about two inches and the longest is maybe four. But yeah, I love scrappy bindings. It's, especially with all these polka dots, it's, you know, if you look at polka dots and you don't smile, there's something wrong. So the, the whole point was to make a joyous quilt and that scrappy polka dotted binding just kind of turned the volume up on the happiness. Our next question is from Gail. Uh, should, asking for advice, Bill, should we stay away from thread painting on a panel if we're using it for a lap quilt? Gail's concerned about the density of the thread weight, but she has read to use lighter bobbin thread to compensate. What are your thoughts on that? So that's a good question. Thread painting, for people who haven't done it, is basically creating an image with dense quilting, so the thread becomes almost solid color. And I think it's great on wall pieces, but I think her, her gut reaction, her uh, sense there is right. I wouldn't use it. I wouldn't do that on a functional quilt because it'll be rough and stiff regardless of the bobbin thread you use. So I think it's, it's more of an artistic gesture than a functional gesture. And so I, I would avoid doing that. So we'll use, uh, tend to use thread painting for wall quilts or quilts that will hang on the wall as showpieces. Yes, or even small, I've done some like really small pieces, like little portraits that might just be like a four by six and that's great. But yeah, I think if, if a quilt gets over quilted, it gets stiff, it can get a little scratchy and it doesn't have a nice drape. Good advice. And our next question is from Barbara and others have asked as well. Uh, you say always wash your quilts. Do you use a special soap and do you put the quilts in the dryer? Okay, so we think about washing our quilts as part of the design. So we know whenever we start a quilt that it is going to get washed and dried. Yes, we put them in the dryer because we use almost always 100% cotton batting and that shrinks about 5%, which gives a wonderful texture. And so from the very beginning, that's on our minds. We wash our quilts with ivory dishwashing liquid, just like a little squirt, not even a tablespoon, maybe half a tablespoon on, in cold water. We use a front load loading washing machine because it's gentle. But whatever you do, that is a soap and not a detergent. There's a big difference chemically. So ivory, just buy a bottle at the grocery store. It lasts a long time. And then we dry our quilts on low and we wash and dry our quilts over and over and over. Well, and, I, sorry, I'm gonna jump in. The <laughs> other plug is I'm a big fan of pre-washing. Some of you don't wanna hear that out there, but, but we pre-wash all of our fabrics for a couple reasons. One, it avoids any issues with bleeding that might happen later. It gets the dust out of them if they've been in your stash and you're using them. It's your health, just work with clean stuff. I know it takes a little time, but to me it's worth it. Our next question is from Nancy. Do you quilt after you turn it inside out? Do you quilt after you turn it inside out? She was oh. thinking of adding an eyelet ruffle on a baby quilt and it sounds like a pillowcase binding backing may or may not work. What do you think, Bill? So definitely with the pillowcase technique, what's 
definitely different here is you put the whole thing together, you turn it inside out, and then you quilt it. So it does present a few additional challenges. If you're trying a pillowcase binding for the first time, it's way easier to start small because you've got all the layers. Um, I think it's best for baby quilts. If you do it for a larger quilt, you could consider either using a spray basting or a fusible batting to hold all the layers together. And, you know, she's clearly thinking, you've got a good engineering mind there. You're thinking it through. And that's the best thing since the eyelet that you're thinking of definitely, you know, you may even draw a little diagram of what each step is. And if you're worried, you know, be worried. That doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means think it through. Uh, the next question is from Amy. Bill, what brand and weight of thread do you like for your quilting? So we are not thread snobs at all. Um, most of the time we use ordinary signature cotton 40 tex, 40 weight quilting um, or uh, thread. They make their threads in a 40 weight and a 50 weight. Now, if you're not used to this terminology, it's a little counterintuitive because the bigger the number, the thinner the thread. So 50 weight is actually thinner than 40 weight. So for our quilting, we almost always use 40 weight. It's a little thicker than some people use, but I like to see the thread. I like to see the quilting. The 50 weight, um, I tend to use that more often when piecing. And you know why? You can get more on a bobbin. And I don't like changing bobbins. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no big reason. It's just kind of, it, you know what it's like. You run out of bobbin in the middle of piecing. It's annoying. So the more I can fit, the better. Uh, less time winding bobbins and more time quilting. And yeah. uh, Bonnie has a similar question with thread, and she asks about fiber content. You talked about weight. Now share your thoughts about fiber content of thread. So with our thread, we always use cotton thread. Um, there are cotton threads, polyester threads, silk threads. I know a lot of hand quilters who like to hand quilt with silk thread. Um, it's a lot more expensive. Uh, it's good for hand quilting. But in terms of machine quilting, the main reason to avoid polyester is it is stronger than cotton. And if you use your quilts a lot, it can actually slowly cut away at the cotton fibers in the quilt top or backing. So it's like a mini saw you know, it is just more durable. So if you have cotton thread with cotton fabric, it's a lot more harmonious and you're less likely to have issues. Uh, thank you, Bill. Our next question is from Leah or Leah. Can you please show the close-up quilting of your labyrinth quilt? Oh, okay. So in the uh, lecture I just did, I believe I showed the give me, oh no, the glyphs quilt, which had the up close. I don't have that with me, but I have another one. The on the dot quilt, now I'm gonna go up close and hold this still. It may be hard to see with the white. However, in Modern Quilts Illustrated, issue number nine that we um, publish, there is a two-page spread showing our strategy and explaining the labyrinth quilting. So that's on modernquiltstudio.com on our site. Wonderful information, Bill. I so enjoyed uh, talking with you and the viewers today. Thank you for being here. Oh, it's such a pleasure. And thank you for all your organization. And you have got a great team there. So thanks to you and thanks to everyone who's listening and taking part in this and keep quilting everyone. Thanks, Bill. And thank you everyone for tuning in to the great Wisconsin Quilt Show and be sure to head over to quiltshow.com and visit Bill and Weeks in the Modern Quilt Studio in the Vendor Mall. Just click on Vendor Mall and explore the different booths and visit the vendors and be sure to take in the special quilt exhibits. Enjoy. <music>